Welcome back to Big Mouth and welcome to Tuesday's edition of the DCEU Daily. But this picture is nothing new. This is from the first Shazam film. What have you got your gob open for, Mick? Well, this is from the legend who played the adult version of this character, of Eugene Choi, in the first uh, um, Shazam movie. And at the bottom, he says, round two coming soon. Yes, the adult version who played Eugene Choi is what? Is it Ross Butler? Is it Ross Butler? Yeah, it's Ross Butler. Absolute great performance, both from the child actor and from the adult actor. And he's teasing that they're shooting Shazam 2, Fury of the Gods, very, very shortly. Yes, welcome to Tuesday's edition of the DCEU Daily. And with Ross Butler posting this and me now knowing, and we've known for a while, that Shazam 2, Fury of the Gods would be in production and shooting very shortly. I asked David F. Sandberg, the director of this film, this question. At Pony Smasher, I do a show on YouTube, YouTube called the DCEU Daily. I have a question I don't expect you to answer. With the Shazam sequel pushed back and releasing after Flashpoint, has the changes to the franchise Flashpoint will bring affected your original plans for the sequel? Now, I haven't had a reply yet, but I only just sent it. So this is... This is part of the interesting conversation. Well, I think it's interesting. Interesting conversation I want to have. Flashpoint is this just this massive moment within the DC Extended Universe where Walter, uh, Walter Hamada and Peter Saffron have come in and said, we are going to gamble everything on one film. This film will change the things within the DC Extended Universe that we don't like and things we know the consumer doesn't like. But what does that mean? Because there's so many different elements and factions of the DC Extended Universe fandom. Some people hate the Snyderverse. Some people love the Snyderverse. Some people hate Birds of Prey. Some people love Birds of Prey. There's been a mixed response to Wonder Woman 84. Certainly not. Nowhere near the icon of a film Wonder Woman 2017 was. And so this is a big thing. This film is going to change so many things. And I was kind of do, trying to do some research within the Flashpoint story. I've read the um, graphic novel multiple times since I heard they were doing this. And yesterday I watched the animated movie uh, Justice League Flashpoint Paradox, which is an interesting version of the story. I think in places the film actually gets a bit lost and some of the things that you see are a bit odd. They don't have any, any context, to be honest with you. But it's really good. It's done really, really well, and I love it. But I was watching it, and I was kind of seeing the bits with kind of um, Bruce Wayne's father as Batman in the new universe that The Flash has created. And I was just kind of using my imagination and thinking of Michael Keaton in that role, because obviously Michael Keaton won't be playing um, Bruce Wayne's father. Or will he? We don't know that. Now, as far as we know, he's playing his his original Batman. But of course, he could be playing Thomas Wayne, Bruce Wayne's father. We don't know. It would be slightly disappointing if that was the case. We want to see Michael Keaton's original Bruce Wayne. But it's going to be interesting. And knowing this now, knowing that Ben Affleck and Michael Keaton will be playing both of their Batman, and what that means to the fandom, because both Batman are loved by two very different fan bases, and sometimes the same fan bases. And so this film is so is so important because ever since its inception, the DC Extended Universe has been a mixed bag for all the fans. Some people love the Snyder bit. Some people hate when Snyder left. Some people like that the Snyder left. Some people like love Aquaman, which Snyder had nothing to do with. In the end, he would have had a lot to do with it. I mean, actually, let's let's not be disrespectful. Snyder cast um, Jason Momoa and Amber Heard. And William Defoe, he did all of that. The reason that Jason Momoa is such a great Aquaman is a little bit to do with Snyder. But what I'm saying is the stuff that he wanted to put in that movie, like Superman and Batman being in it, which would have linked in heavily to what happened in his Justice League movie, didn't happen. It was totally a different film. And basically the only kind of crossover you get in Aquaman is Mira mentioning the fact that... Um, Basically, um, Arthur Curry, Aquaman, helped you know, uh, defeat Steppenwolf, and that's it. 
that, that that's all you get in the film. But that's actually evidence that Walter Hamada was still not contradicting anything that Snyder had done before. And because it was a very difficult situation, Aquaman, it came after the only flop in the in the franchise's history, which is Justice League, for many, many reasons, many people's faults, not just Joss Whedon. Joss Whedon was under a hell of a lot of pressure, and it was amazing he was able to execute anything in the time frame that he had. And so we've got this really weird, controversial franchise, and someone's been brought in to fix this thing, to make it a cohesive franchise, a franchise where all fans can enjoy it. I think it's like what Jim Lee said the other day. This is going to be a franchise for something that's going to have something for everyone. And I think that's so important. And a lot of people don't think that's important because they just want the Snyder fans, just want the Snyder stuff. Um, the hardcore DC fans want to see the hardcore DC stuff. So everyone's selfish and everyone, including me, wants to see um, from a DC franchise what they want to see. For me, I think the DC multiverse strategy after Flashpoint should have a place for Zack Snyder, should have a place for the central hardcore DC fans who want to see something that they've been reading all their lives. There should be a space for everyone. And also, there should be opportunities to kind of have representation and inclusion, um, have different actors from different backgrounds playing these characters on another earth. These are all the reasons why they're doing this. So if, uh, if a Hispanic actor plays Superman on another earth, it isn't going to be controversial. Do you understand? Um, lots of different things like that. But the main reason is to take this film Flashpoint and its concept. And I think it's going to be very different. But then you look at something like in this new universe, Wonder Woman and Aquaman are evil fuckers who have created a war. And Wonder Woman's literally taken over Earth and called it New Themyscira. I mean, she I mean, in this animated movie, she's so evil. She beheads Mira when Mira catches her and Aquaman doing it. She's brutal. She kills people for fun. She doesn't even care. She kills Steve Trevor in this universe. Wow. Imagine Gal Gadot holding him up, right, from her, you know, her uh, the uh, whip of Hastian, right, whatever you call it, and she starts choking um, Chris Pine, Steve Trevor. How compelling would that be? Now, people would be going absolute nuts, but actually, it doesn't have to be controversial if they actually did this. Now, a lot of um, bloggers believe this isn't going to happen in the movie. I do. Because like I researched Walter Hamada, I, I researched Andy Machete and his sister. And actually, Andy Machete is someone who will fight for this moment of Wonder Woman being evil in this new universe um, that um, Barry Allen creates. Because at the end of the day, at the beginning of the film, you're going to see the real pure Wonder Woman. At the end of the film, you will see the real pure Wonder Woman when the universe has been reset and Barry goes back to kind of the way it was, but it's going to be a little bit different. We know that. And this is what I'm trying to say. So to have a dark, evil kind of bitch Wonder Woman in a new universe doesn't matter because when you go back, it's like, let me get, it's like Back to the Future 2 when Marty changes the present and everything's different, but when he goes back, it's all back to normal, and it's fine. And, then, and, then, and, there's, and there's no problem with that. Of course, seeing Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman doing such dark deeds will be harrowing for people, but I think it's important they leave that in. I, I personally think, and at the moment, as well as Zack Snyder's Justice League, this is the movie I keep on thinking about, because as a massive, passionate DCEU fan and DC fan in general, when you think of a film called Flashpoint, which we've been you know, having wet dreams for years about it being in live action. It was going to happen and it wasn't going to happen. And now it is happening. Zack Snyder's original Flashpoint and the original idea when he brought a director in was for Flashpoint. And that's what he was originally going to do. And people said, oh, it's too soon for Flashpoint. Well, now it's not too soon for Flashpoint. They need to do it. Not only is Flashpoint going to be a restructuring of the DC Extended Universe, it's kind of an origin movie uh, for Barry Allen. I mean, they kind of set, I don't know about Zack Snyder's Justice League, but they kind of set up the relationship with his father as well in prison. I don't know who shot that sequence there, if it was reshot or not, but I actually thought it was done really well. And the chemistry between um, Ezra Miller and the guy playing his father, uh, you know, someone who's worked with Zack so many times, um, was a good scene. So 
Look, I'm sure we're going to get all of that in Zack Snyder's Justice League anyway. And so we got this kind of Flash origin story here. And I think it works. I've said this before. I think Flashpoint can work as a Flash origin. And the Flashpoint movie that represents the entire of the DCEU. So unlike the actual graphic novel, this is going to have a lot of... They're going to use this to implement cameos. Cameos from iterations of DC live action that are nothing to do with the DC Extended Universe. Arrow, you know, the Reeve era, lots of different things, right? They're going to do this. Already we know Michael Keaton's Batman's involved. Rumours of Nick Cage's Superman, who actually never got to make the film. So these are the kind of things that they want to do. But in the middle of all this, they want to restructure the franchise. This is such a massive gamble. For Walter Hamada and Peter Saffron. Let me tell you something about Walter Hamada and Peter Saffron. They've been a team for years. They were a very successful team over, new, over at New Line Cinema with their horror movies. People say that Walter Hamada isn't a comic book fan. Well, he wasn't a horror movie fan either. But look, he licked. He licked that franchise to death. It was amazing. He did a great job, as did Peter Saffron as his partner. Now, Walter Hamada may not be a big DC man, but Peter Saffron is. Just like Peter Saffron is a big um, horror movie aficionado as well. He likes, he loves both franchises. So they're, they're a great partnership. They're both very, very intelligent people. And I, I feel very confident about trusting them in this. And this is from someone who loves Zack Snyder. But we've got to, I think there's a lot of people within the fandom right now, especially the Snyderverse fandom. And I'm a part of that fandom, but I'm an all-round DC fan, as you will know. I think a lot of people who support Zach are not DC fans, and that's okay. You don't have to be. There's no rules here. But sometimes when you hear them saying things and fighting for things, it isn't for the best of DC as a whole, of this live-action universe. So we have to trust Peter and Walter to do this film Flashpoint. And I think this is why they allowed Jenkins to do what she did with Wonder Woman 84, and allowed Robbie to do what she did with Birds of Prey because they thought, fuck it, it doesn't matter. We're going to change everything anyway when we do Flashpoint. So I think that's funny. So it's very interesting now. Anything that comes before Flashpoint now is, is, is going to be fun. It's great to see. But it all could be just smashed just like that, which I think is kind of interesting in terms of Birds of Prey and Wonder Woman 84. And it's interesting. If Pay Jenkins... Like we've been told by Toby Emmerich, does return to do Wonder Woman 3. Uh, what kind of film will that be within this new world of the DC Extended Universe after Flash? Should we say AF? AF is after Flashpoint, right? What are those films going to look like? And this is the problem with getting hardcore directors who want to do their own thing. It clashes with what the studio wants to do, what, what Walter Hamada and Peter Saffron want to do. So I think... After Wonder Woman 3, it would be better if Patty Jenkins goes. If she doesn't want to make something that kind of is part of the universe and helps the universe, not just her movie. I don't want anyone involved who doesn't want to help DC as a whole. This is why um, Kevin Feige gets certain directors in that are, are quite happy to listen to the showrunner, who is Kevin Feige. He will allow them to do their thing as well. It's Compromise isn't always bad. We talk about the, you know, the Justice League being compromised. But two people can compromise and they can get half their way each. And this is the new way that's going to happen. It's going to happen under Walter Hamada. Whether you like it or not, this is the way it's going to be. And this may not be the best thing for you and what you want. But I believe everyone will have their avenue to enjoy in the DC Extended Universe. And this is what the multiverse strategy is is all about. So I think, listen, it's a mat look. It is a gamble because it has to work. They have to do this properly. It has to restructure. The number one thing, it has to restructure the universe in a way the audience is going to like when this film is finished. But that you are going to have so many cameos to enjoy and this will unify all the Earths together. It, it's very interesting. So when this film's finished, literally anything will be possible. We will not be in this situation where I hear people say, oh, Henry Cavill can't make a Superman movie for five years. He's doing The Witcher. Not true anyway. Nonsense anyway. 
actors could do three or four uh, movies a year, even with COVID. Stop giving me that BS. But it doesn't matter now. If he can't do his Superman, then we'll just bring another Superman from another Earth. And of course, J.J. Abrams is very close to announcing that he will be the writer-director for his Superman movie, which of course will come after Flashpoint as well. He will be the central Superman, as I've always said. Henry will be over on HBO Max, as I've always said. So there's so many things. Flashpoint isn't just a film. You know, 10 years ago, we heard they were doing a Flashpoint movie. Yeah! Flashpoint movie, copy and pasted movie is going to be cool, man. Now, this film means so much to the outer um, development and the future of this franchise. This film is so vital and important. And I don't care if I'm boring you, but I'm never going to stop talking about it until I see. Actually, after I see it, I'll be talking about it even more. Arrow stole and screwed up a major Flash villain. Actually, the Arrowverse has screwed up so many things after the second season. I mean, season five was pretty cool, by the way, but mostly this show dropped the bomb. In fact, the franchise dropped the bomb so many times because it wasn't full of DC fans trying to make great DC content. I don't know what it was about anymore, but it was very watered down. Anyway, Arrow introduced one of the Flash's biggest villains from the comics, and not only did the show steal their, that character, but they screwed that foe over. By Andy, whose surname I can never pronounce. Arrow didn't only steal Captain Boomerang, or one of the Flash's biggest villains, but they also screwed over the character massively. Now, this is interesting because in Suicide Squad, I think he's freaking awesome. So they kind of fixed it a bit there, didn't they? Uh, with some of the Arrowverse's shows, it, it is not unusual for the DC dramas to borrow each other's villains from, from the um, respective mythologies. In the case of Arrow, they ended up using one of the biggest enemies from the Flash mythology. The same reason that the Flash premiered on the CW, the network began their annual crossovers that have only gotten bigger and bigger for, ver for every season. For their first crossover, Flash vs. Arrow, the Brave and the Bold, the second night event had Oliver Queen and Barry Allen go up against not one, but two of the fastest man alive's roads. The first was Rainbow Raider, who had the ability to uh, awaken a person's inner rage, which caused the Flash and the Arrow to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with one another. That was a brilliant crossover. Oh, the beautiful early days of Arrowverse, wasn't it? Do you remember it? How beautiful and pure it was. Anyway, the second half of the crossover, which took place on Arrow, introduced Digger Harkness, a.k.a. Captain Boomerang, played by Nick Tarbay. While Captain Boomerang is known as one of the slightly goofier Flash villains, the Arrowverse iteration was a lot darker and was previously a member of the Suicide Squad during his first appearance. Captain Boomerang is trying to take out Lila, uh, Lila Michaels, but is initially stopped by the heroes. Despite his attempt, teams Flash and Arrow managed to stop the five bombs that he had placed all over Star City. After he gets locked up at Lian Yu through uh, through Argos, the villain doesn't make a return to Arrow until two seasons later. While Captain Boomerang does return in the Flash season, uh, season zero tie-in comic as part of the Suicide Squad, Taraibe's character is absent for a few years on screen. But when Captain Boomerang eventually does make his return to the Arrowverse, Arrow manages to mess the character up. Harkness re-emerges in, in Arrow season five finale. Lian Yu, which took uh, Oliver's war with Prometheus back to the island that began the Emerald Archer's journey as Oliver. As Oliver needs extra reinforcement, he recruits both Slade Wilson, Deathstroke and Hartness, who were locked up together. But it doesn't take long for Captain Boomerang to turn on, on the Green Arrow and his team. Captain Boomerang, who joins Prometheus' team, does face a shocking fate before the season finale ended. To save his daughter, Faya, Malcolm Merlin blows him himself up after ste stepping on a landmine, which ends up killing the Flash villain. This was the final straw in Arrow's complicated treatment of Captain Boomerang. Not only did Arrow manage to block the Flash from using Harkness for even a single episode, but it did so with an overly serious and thus somewhat inaccurate portrayal of Captain Boomerang. You see, this is where I disagree. It's fine. It's fine to go darker with a character who hasn't been dark before if it works and it makes sense. While he is definitely one of the deadlier villains of the rogues, Captain Boomerang is also one of the more comic relief ones. Something that can be seen with Jay Courtney's version of the character in the DCEU. Now, 
He is a bit goofy. He does like to crack jokes and cross the line and all that. I think they did a great job with I thought David there did a wonderful job with him, by the way. And Jay Courtney, is he coming back? I think Jay's coming back, isn't he? Which I'm really excited about um, seeing him back in James Gunn's The Suicide Squad. So I think they got him right. There was a balance with the character there. It's possible that one of the reasons why Arrow was so limited in how they could use Captain Boomerang was because of Suicide Squad. I don't agree. Arrow's Boomerang appeared the same month that Warner Brothers unveiled the entire Suicide Squad cast for David Ayer's film, which included Courtney playing the cinematic version of Hartman's. Back then, Warner Brothers was picky with which characters could be on TV at the same time as the DCEU used them. It seems like Captain Boomerang was maybe one of them, hence why he had to be written in a more gritty way and why he only appeared in three episodes across three years. Listen, the reason for him only being around for three episodes in three years might be because of Suicide Squad, but no one was interfering how this guy would be represented in the Arrowverse. That's, that's on them. Now, i tell you something, I can't even remember him on Arrowverse, so he couldn't have been that great in the first place. But now that the rules seem to have gotten looser, the Flash could try again with Captain Boomerang. They'd either use Crisis on Infinite Earths to undo his death and reimagine him, especially now that Tarabai will appear in Stargirl Season 2 as a different DC character, or introduce Owen Mercer, the second person to carry that mantle. Even if the Flash never uses Captain Boomerang, there's no denying that Arrow both stole and screwed up the character through his Arrowverse depiction. He's probably got a point, but as I say, I've never, I can't remember him in season five now, and I love season five. And the Prometheus, the Prometheus thing is up there with Deathstroke in in the first two seasons as well, especially season two. He was he was also one of the best DC villains ever, um, but I can't remember him. So he, they must have, he, he must, Andy must be right. They must have done such a shit job with him because I can't remember him at all. Black Adam won't work without Zack Snyder's darkness. Before we go into this, I think he would make an amazing Black Adam movie. But here's the thing, you know, um, Dwayne The Rock Johnson's team is developing They'll be shooting sooner rather than later. So it's a bit late for this conversation now. So I'm sure Zach would have done an amazing job. But I trust Dwayne The Rock Johnson and his people to make an awesome, epic Black Adam movie. And this is where they're going with, we're going to see how good this is. You know, basically, he was very much involved in Shazam as well, The Rock. So that was a pretty neat film. We'll have to wait and see. I agree. Personally, I'd love Zach to be in charge of the whole of the DC live action universe, but that opportunity has gone. Once he was driven out of Justice League, that opportunity was never going to come again because Warner Media know that although they respect him as a great creative and artist, the, the mainstream audience, the people that you need to come in to watch your movies, don't like Zack Snyder's style. And that lies the problem. I love his style, you love his style, but unfortunately enough people don't for him to be the central leader of the DC Extended Universe. With his in induction into the DCEU, Black Adam may prove to be the perfect DC character for Zack Snyder's notable darker brand of storytelling by Liam Carrigan. The problem is, Liam, it's not going to happen, mate. Black Adam, the Dwayne The Rock Johnson-led DC comic adaption set for cinemas at the end of 2021, seems a movie per perfectly suited to Zack Snyder's darker storytelling. But... Zack Snyder doesn't make dark movies. It's funny how people have pigeonholed him with this. He makes realistic movies about fant fantasy characters, right, from mainly DC. So he takes fantasy, he takes those fantastical characters and puts them in a gritty real world. That, that's not dark movie making. Anyway, ask DC fans for their thoughts on Snyder and the most common response will no doubt refer to their divisive nature. While some loved his more grounded take on Superman in 2013's Man of Steel, others felt that it was depressing and not a true interpretation of the character. Well, here's the thing about Man of Steel. That's an interesting thing because people go on about Man of Steel being dark. If you, if you compare Man of Steel to BVS, you can throw the dark thing and uncompromising thing in there. But when you look at Man of Steel, because it was Nolan and Goya who wrote that movie, did the story and Goya did the screen story as well, right? That movie has levity in it. You, you, you literally, the end bit with Clark and Lois on the, in the Daily Planet. Welcome to the planet. And he smiles and it's great. 
So there was kind of a gritty, hardcore, real world feel about Man of Steel, but they still, it, it, he still felt like the Superman that I read in comics and saw in the Superman movies in, in the 80s. It, but when you look at Batman versus Superman, the intention looked really different in that film because Zack literally had full control of that movie. Snyder responded by doubling down on this for the movie sequel 2016's Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice. This ultimately split audiences further with the main complaint revolving around how out of character many felt it was to have a usually wholesome figure like Superman appear as anything but. But I think Superman is still, he is wholesome in BVS. The thing is with BVS, he doesn't know where to. He doesn't know where to turn. He doesn't know what he wants to be. He's under pressure from the government. You know, there's there's a committee on on Superman. You know, talking about him, accusing him of killing people. So he's in a really, he's in a really thoughtful, darker place. So he's not the Superman that we grew up with, but he, he's a Superman who hasn't been on Earth for long, and people still don't believe in him. That's a great gritty story to tell. Not necessarily un Superman. In fact. The questions being asked here are questions that should have been asked years ago of Superman, probably. But did people want to see it? That's the question. Unlike Superman, the current version of Black Adam is not a wholesome figure. By any stretch of the imagination, he has long been an enemy of Billy Batson's heroic alter ego Shazam. Even if he's also occasionally a, re a reluctant anti-hero, Adam started out in ancient Egypt with heroic intentions to free those enslaved by dictators in his home of conduct, but also pos uh, possess an undeniable hunger for power that would eventually see him develop into a more villainous role. In most modern iteration, he serves as the guardian of conduct, ranging between their god and yet another despot. A brooding tyrant with mi a millennia of pent-up angst and anger management issues seems far more suited to a darker tale than everyone's favourite big blue, blue scout. Indeed, those leading Black Adam should look to everything that 2019 Sh Sh Shazam did and do the opposite. That movie was filled with fun, providing the perfect tonic for those who felt that Batman vs. Superman Dawn of Justice was too gloomy. However, as his arch nemesis, Black Adam is everything that Shazam isn't, where Billy Batson has hope, Black Adam brings fear. Where the young hero beats down bad guys with ease, Black Adam won't stop there. Having Black Adam film be more akin to Zack Snyder's overall film tone than Shazam could allow for the DCEU to divide their franchise more clearly between darker films and more MCU-esque affairs, satisfying fans of each type of movie. Well, this is the reason we're getting the multiverse strategy so everyone can get what they want. Amongst those who dislike Man of Steel, their most common complaint revolved around the final 50 minutes of the film. That heroes seemingly show complete disregard for human life as Superman General Zod proceeded to destroy most of, of downtown Metropolis. Right. Superman didn't decide, oh, I know, I'll destroy Metropolis for a laugh. He's fighting a very strong villain. And unfortunately, when you're fighting a villain, even when you're Superman, you can't keep on putting things back together or picking people up or stopping people being crushed. Now, in Superman 2, they made sure that Superman was able to fight the three villains from Krypton and save people as well. They didn't do that. They wanted a more realistic take. He can't do both things at the same time in Man of Steel because that's the reality they wanted to be in. Before the hero finally snapped Zod's neck in a last ditch act of desperation, likewise the no-killing rule which Batman tries to follow in the comics was abandoned completely for Dawn of Justice, much to the char chagrin of many fans. Black Adam has none of these hang-ups. He can kill at will, and that makes him the perfect specimen for a darker DC movie, the likes of which Zack Snyder excels in, though Snyder himself does not at present appear to be directly involved in the project. He's not. This wouldn't prevent the makers of Black Adam to follow some of his cues, perhaps how well Snyder's new cut of Justice League is received when it releases in March will inform the direction Black Adam ultimately takes. It won't. Let me tell you why. Black Adam is a notorious dark character. I mean in tone. I don't mean in background, you know, let, let's get that straight here. But he's a, the tone of the character is darker. He will kill people. He can kill people. As they've said, he's full of rage, as Liam said, rage and anger. He's a very volatile character. Zack doesn't want to deal with characters like that. He likes dealing with pure heroes like Superman and Batman. Why? 
because then he can ask questions of the audience. He can trigger a reaction. He doesn't want to do a film about someone who's already a killer, so he can make him a killer. That's not interesting to Zach. This is not why he does what he does. This is not why he did Watchmen. This is not why he did Man of Steel and BVS. He wants to take pure heroes and not darken them up, but put them in a real world. And that's why he does what he does. So there's no question of Zach want and have any interest in Black Adam. He'd make an epic Black Adam movie, but Black Adam is already kind of a villain and a killer. So that would pose no interest to Zack Snyder. So about to sign off for today's DCEU Daily on this Tuesday. And I just want to go back to Flashpoint before I do sign off. Flashpoint is the biggest gamble in film history. I have never seen a situation where a franchise is so divisive and so many different people either like it, hate it or indifferent about it. And then a studio and the person in charge of, of the president of DC Films comes in and says, from the beginning, by the way, because he set the, the, he set the, the, the phrase, the worlds of DC. He had this plan for the multiverse strategy, Hamada and Peter Saffron all along. So now what they want to do is fix something they believe needs fixing to bring them money, to bring them popularity and for it to be successful totally like the MCU is. So they think they found a way of doing that. This is the biggest gamble ever. And as I said in my video yesterday, everyone has to start pulling in the right direction for this to be a thing. So anyone who doesn't want to be part of this can't be part of this. You all have to be following. You know, if Walter Hamada says nil, you nil. If, if Walter Hamada says call me sir, you call him sir. This is how it works over at the MCU. People like Kevin Feige. I think people like Walter Hamada. I just think that Ray Fisher has sucked him in to something that really... It, look, imagine, right, imagine being Walter Hamada coming in in 2018 after Justice League and having to sort a film out like Aquaman straight away, trying to sort this, let's call it what it is, a mess. Too many voices, too many voices. One voice comes in, he tries to sort it out. Then Zack Snyder's Justice League is announced to be on HBO Max. And then you've got an investigation being launched. And one of the people, and let's be clear here, there's a big difference between Joss Whedon and Jeff Johns. Joss Whedon was an employee of WB. They could kick him out just like that. <clears throat> Easy. But Jeff Johns isn't an employee of Warner Media. He's a partner. And as a partner, it's very difficult to dissolve those arrangements because the truth is they don't want to dissolve those arrangements. They don't want to dissolve his his inclusion and involvement in the DC movies or in Stargirl. Stargirl's doing very well for them. They don't want to get rid of Jeff Johns. So according to Ray, they will part company with him. But let me tell you, if that's true, that's going to take a very long time. You could be talking years or months at least, because of the arrangements they have with him. Very, very difficult to get rid of Jeff Johns, as I said from the beginning, but we will see what happens there. So Flashpoint is this big moment, this big gamble. I've never seen a franchise saved, right? And it's interesting when I say saved, because apart from Justice League, each one of the DC Extended Universe movies has made a profit. Some big, some little, doesn't matter. They've been successful, made good money. But because it's all compared to the MCU, everyone or people, certain people see the DCEU as a failure. So Walter Hamada needs to change the perception. So after we've seen Flashpoint, if the perception is that this is a new, exciting direction for the DC Extended Universe that still involves Zack Snyder, involves Matt Reeves and different directors and producers and writers and actors, everyone's going to be happy. If it fails... I don't know where we go next with this. But I, I, one final question for you before I leave today. If Flashpoint could bring one character back to life for you, who would it be? Well, I'm going to say a joint two. First of all, I'm going to say Steve Trevor. But when he comes back, I'm not going to have him with Diana. No, just like the comics or one version of the comics, I'm going to have him working with the Suicide Squad. And my other pick, my top pick, is Michael Shannon's General Zod. I'm losing my voice here, aren't I? 
But I've got to say this, yeah. Michael Shannon's General Zod would be the other character I'd bring back to life um, in Flashpoint. Because I think, even though... I, I don't... I, <clears throat> It's not, I'm gonna, I'm just, I'm just not gonna work anyway, start again. Even though I don't have an issue with the next, the next snapping moment in a uh, Man of Steel, I think it's a shame when you see characters like, um, Nicholson's Joker being killed off. I know they knew he wasn't gonna come back and he was too expensive, but I don't wanna see characters like the Joker and Zod killed off. I want to see them with the potential, even if they never do, the potential of them returning. So if it was up to me, in Flashpoint, I would bring back to life General Zod, Michael Shannon's General Zod, and Chris Pine's Steve Trevor. Steve Trevor would be part of the Suicide Squad, and I'd, I would give Chris as much as possible. Give him his own world to be in, in the DC Extended Universe, because he's such a good actor. And to let him go, it, it, it is daft, and I know this is why Patty brought him back, but she just didn't do it in a proper way or in a permanent way. It's time for Flashpoint to bring Steve Trevor back, and I'd love to see General Zod back as well. So with that said, comment down below. Let me know what characters you'd like to see return within Flashpoint. Let me know. Comment down below. Like, share, and subscribe. And me and my voice need a break now, so I'll see you tomorrow for even more DCEU Daily. See you again soon.